Hi everyone, in this video we will start texturing the sci-fi corridor. This video will be a little bit different from the previous ones. I won't show you and explain everything in detail, and the speed of the video will increase and decrease depending on the importance of what is being shown. So let's just jump right in. Here I'm in Substance Designer. I'm using Grunge and Dirt nodes to create some basic textures. These will act as placeholders in the scene to replace the plain material references that are currently on the objects. I start to UV map all of the objects in the scene. UV mapping is a bit of a technical art form and there are many resources available to teach you about the most efficient ways to map your content. Personally, I am not too worried about efficiency. We don't need to worry too much about saving space for our textures as we are recycling them across our material instances. After an object has been mapped, I assign it a material using some of the textures that we made just to make sure that everything is working fine. I will continuously come back to fly around the scene, where I will decide which object needs to be UV mapped next. I'll continue by mapping some of the less significant but repetitive details. Keep in mind that these detail objects offer demonstration and have no purpose, which is why they are so simple in design. I assign a material to them, which is propagated to all prefab instances, and continue to check the result using scene lighting before moving on to mapping other objects. Something to note about the design of the models is that they are using beveled edges. The main reason for this is that originally I was not planning on texturing this content, so giving the basic objects curved edges would look nicer in the light. This makes it a bit more tedious to UV map them though. If I wanted to be very considerate of performance, I would go through a process called texture baking, which in this case would mean taking details from a high poly object and baking them into pixel data of a normal map, which is then wrapped around a lower poly model. If you are not too close to the lower poly model, then both the low and high object should look almost the same. One thing that I am looking out for on my wrapped objects is any distortion in the way that the texture data is being wrapped around them. The reason we would see this is if we were not careful when mapping our models in Blender and accidentally ignored an incorrect UV island in the UV image editor. Some of the objects are easier to map than others. The beveled edges on the objects have predictable edge loops, which means we can be quite confident about mapping them provided there aren't many intersections or diversions that would interrupt the edge flow. I had to make a decision about the ceiling piece. Because a single object will share texture space amongst the UV islands, it means that the larger the surface area of the object, the more stretched out the textures will appear. This could be mitigated if the textures were seamless by giving the object its own material and increasing the tiling amount until the textures match the rest of the surroundings. So what I did was separate the ceiling piece into two different objects and then reconstruct them inside of the scene. After they were ready, I went ahead and started mapping them. I noticed that on parts of my object, textures were being distorted. Quite often, if you are not careful when using n-gons like me, so occasionally using faces with more than four sides, the wrapping algorithm can have trouble in preserving the proportions of the faces. Ideally, you would want to stick to quads when modeling for game engines, since it's easy for the engine to triangulate afterwards, and you maintain edge flow inside of the modeling software. A way to remedy this, in my case, is to add more supporting geometry and seams to make it explicitly clear to the algorithm how we want to preserve the shape in the map. If I was building this for an actual game project, I would have been more careful with the geometry from the beginning, but being freeform with the modeling has actually provided us with good examples of what to watch out for. The only issue with adding more seams is that there are more places that they are visible. Ideally, we would want to hide our seams in places that the player won't look as much. There's no good way to perfectly hide seams other than being careful with especially normal and height data in the textures. Some texture painting softwares have features specifically designed for blending pixel data along the seams, but it becomes more difficult if the edges of your UV islands are not parallel to the pixels in a texture map, which would end up causing some jagged effects at the seams. Look carefully enough in any of your favorite games and you will find them. For the slats, I thought that it might be easy to map them individually since there wouldn't be much to do for each individual section, but given the obvious distortion I had to do a little bit of remedy work. 
This meant it would be easier to get one slat perfect and then duplicate it, replacing the old geometry. I did, however, forget to map the whole object after duplication, so all of the slats were sharing texture space. There is nothing wrong with this, in fact it's actually a good idea for space consumption, and you'll see this happen quite often with the use of things called texture atlases in other workflows. But in my case I would like all of the slats to be unique just in case I wanted to paint some specific details on them later on. Now just to remind you these are placeholder textures, they can be replaced with more appropriate ones at any point because we are keeping a workflow that relies on interchangeable materials. As I continued to map the scene objects, I realized that I could be giving myself more freedom in the way of material references. For this upper object, I noticed that it is only using one material. I decided that the ceiling bracket and lower section of the mesh should be using different materials and so I assigned them appropriately before going back into Unity and making changes to the prefab. For this lower detail object, I first of all test out automatic smart UV mapping just to see what the result is like. I decide it's not good enough and continue with manually mapping the object. The problem with smart mapping is that it gets confused by curved topology. It does not know how to consistently seam the corners of these beveled edges. There are a lot of people working on different kinds of automatic mapping tools, so I expect that in the future an artist will not be required to map the content manually, especially if we bring machine learning into the mix. Right now, I am continuing by going on one of my walks around the scene. I find it quite chill just to walk around and give myself a mental break in between tedious tasks like mapping. Moving on, I finish doing the pipe models and move on to the architectural segment separator. You'll see that I changed my blender theme because the colors I was using made it a bit difficult to see exactly what I was selecting. While doing this, I give the material assignments colors of a higher contrast to make them easier to identify in the editor as well. Again, I feel like I could give myself more freedom by giving the object a better material variety. Next up are structural elements, starting with the end wall segments. Their topology is predictable and easy to map. Then comes along the corner segments for junctions, which can't be seen very well behind the details, but they need to be done anyway. And after that comes the straight segments. This sidebar prop is going to get a bit more attention later on because we will make some bespoke textures for it in 3D coat. The upper wiring now needs some love. What I do is try to hide seams in creative places, such as where the cables are being held up by brackets. Then I'll go ahead and get the minor details done. This is another object that needs some more material references, so I go ahead and do that. It's much easier to see these with the new interface colors. I think it's always important to try and make sure you're making your experience with the software as comfortable as possible. There's not a lot more to map, which means we can soon start moving on. This larger piping piece is another one that I will give some extra attention to in 3D Code later on. There's no real criteria for what I will or will not give some extra attention to. Generally, I just assign interchangeable materials to large pieces, but if those large pieces tend to have a lot of finer details, then I might make an exception and paint them. In this case, I'll be doing it more for demonstration. Before that though, I'm going to start replacing some of the original material instances and begin giving the scene some style. What I want to do to start is give the perimeter piping some variation in colour. Once I'm happy with that, I'll go for a walk and check it out.
One thing that keeps nagging me though is that I really don't like the look of the segment separators for the piping. They're too thick and clunky, so what I do is start to reconstruct them into something that I actually like. Once it's ready, I assign the material references and start preparing it as a prefab inside of Unity. A fault that crosses my mind is that the central ring of the object would look really cool with emissive effect. In terms of functionality, it could also make sense because the light could indicate that there is something moving through that section of the pipeline. I think it looks pretty cool and matches the mood quite well. So I replicate this for the other pipelines and prepare emissive material instances with the appropriate colors. Walking around, I'm starting to get a feel for how I want the scene to look in the end. Making use of emissive light as details in the environment is quite a common feature in my work. Now we move on to giving a couple of the objects some extra attention in the form of texture painting. I want to start off with the pipe segment separators because I feel like the placeholder materials don't really work with it. The new materials for them look quite nice in the coloured light. Then we move on to the larger piping detail. I play around with a few different kinds of metals before settling on something almost black and white. And then comes the handlebars. Once that's done, I take another look around. One thing that I notice is that this doesn't look a lot like modern, sleek, high-budget interpretations of sci-fi corridors, rather something much more colourful and retro, like something straight out of a classic sci-fi pulp magazine. Taking another look at the placeholder materials, I think that the grungy crack details are too strong to make sense so I start to make a copy with more faded details. I feel like this could be a good place to add some colour accents. I give it some blue, and I actually quite like how it looks. It reminds me of Star Wars for some reason, I think some of the ships had some blue stripes along the side that look a bit like this. So, having a look around, I'm quite happy with the progress. It's set us up to take this in any number of directions. I always feel like the scene could use more purpose and detail, so that's something I'm going to aim for. As mentioned earlier, the look of this scene is giving me some classic pulp sci-fi vibes, so I'm going to use that as inspiration. Just like the previous series, video 3 is going to be less talk and more time lapse. I will set myself the goal of giving the scene more detail and purpose, and then we'll reconvene at the end to see what we have made. With that being said, if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and ring that bell, and I'll see you in part 3.